Hi, welcome to another episode of Z Notes Live. I'm your host, Aishwarya, and we have Afreen with us. And today we will be discussing plant nutrition. That is chapter six from IGCSC Bio. Over to you, Afreen. Uh, hi. So as Aishwarya said, we will be doing IGCSC Biology chapter six. That is plant nutrition. So we'll be focusing on two main topics. That is 6.1 and 6.2. Uh, so let's begin. So this is uh, plant nutrition. The chapter six is about plant nutrition and the first part focuses on photosynthesis. So this is the syllabus and we'll be looking at what is photosynthesis. Uh, we'll be looking at the word and chemical equations for photosynthesis. We we'll learn about some chemical compos um, we we'll learn about the chemical uh, chlorophyll and its uses and its purpose and the products of photosynthesis and the, the uses of the products as well as the different minerals required for uh, survival of a plant. And we'll look at something called limiting factor. So to begin, uh, we, we need to know that for the syllabus requires you to know the definition of photosynthesis, which um, is just the process by which plants synthesize. Synthesize means to create or to produce uh, carbohydrates from raw materials using energy from light. Uh, you'll need to know the word and chemical equations for this. Uh, the chemical equation is only for extended students. So uh, if you're not going for the extended syllabus, then you can avoid that. Just know the word equation. Uh, it's carbon dioxide plus water uh, reacts to give glucose and oxygen. Now the chemical equation is um, 6 CO2 plus 6 H2O gives 6 C6 C6 H12O6 plus 6 O2. Now the numbers here are very important because uh, the equation needs to be balanced. So the number of carbon on both sides of the equation needs to be same. The number of oxygens need to be the same. The number of hydrogens need to be the same. Um, and if you recognize from, from previous chapters, CO2 is carbon dioxide, H2O is water, C6, H12, O6 is glucose, and O2 is just oxygen. And then there's the, there are a few requirements for the reaction to, be occur, uh, to occur, that is light and chlorophyll. So light is required so that chemi it can be converted to chemical energy for the reaction to take place. And chlorophyll is a, um, it's a green pigment that's what gives the plant its um, signature green color. And chlorophyll basically transfers energy from light into uh, energy in chemicals for the synthesis of car carbohydrates. So basically, uh, chlorophyll is responsible uh, for converting light energy into chemical energy. That's what I mentioned earlier. And that's the first part of it. Now we will need to look at the use of carbohydrates. So if you remember from the equation that a carbohydrate is a product uh, so a carbohydrate is a product of photosynthesis and they are used and stored in uh, a few ways. So carbohydrates are stored in different um, forms. So there's starch. Starch is used as an energy store. And then there's cellulose. Cellulose is used to build cell walls. So if you'll remember from the previous chapters, um, plants have cell walls. Plant cells have cell walls made of cellulose. So this cellulose comes from photosynthesis. And then glucose obviously is used in a respiration to provide energy uh, so that the organism can continue to survive. And then there's sucrose. Sucrose is transported uh, in the phloem. And then there's nectar. Nectar is essential in attracting insects for pollination. So not all plants will have nectars. Only plants that rely on insect uh, pollination uh, uh, produce nectar. And then there's other nutrients that uh, plants need to survive. Uh, there's nitrate ions, uh, which is used for making amino acids, and a deficiency of uh, nitrate ions would cause stunted or slow growth. And then plants also require magnesium ions, which is uh, they need it for uh, making chlorophyll, and the, a deficiency will result in yellow leaves and inefficiency in photosynthesis. N so to ensure that plants have proper amount uh, a proper amount of intake of these nutrients. Farmers usually use fertilizers and a common fertilizers uh, farmers use is NPK. 
So the N stands for nitrogen, the P stands for phosphorus, and K stands for uh, potassium. Now, for now, you need to know about the nitrogen fertilizers. So nitri nit nitrogen fertilizers provide nitrogen in, in various forms, such as nitrate ions, uh, nitrite ions, or ammonium ions. So there's three main ways. Um, however, an excessive use of uh, fertilizers can use to eutrophication, which is basically when the, the nutrient, the nitrate rich soil is run off and it ends up in waters, nearby water bodies and uh, causing um, accelerated growth of, uh, accelerated growth of uh, uh, water plants like algae. So this basically restricts oxygen for other living organisms in the water body. This is something we will look uh, into further detail in another chapter. So that's why uh, using excessive fertilizers is bad as it can lead to eutrophication. Um, okay, so now we're looking at limiting factors. This is something you need to memorize. Limiting factor is something present in the environment in such short supply that it restricts life processes. So uh, in, in the case of plants, limiting factors could be light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration, and temperature. So in this particular example, we're looking at light intensity. So uh, as the amount of light increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases. And this is shown in the graph uh, from point A to point B, the rate of photosynthesis increases as the light intensity increases. Um, and then after a certain point, increasing the light intensity has no effect on the rate of photosynthesis. And this is shown on the graph uh, by point C. So now the limiting factor is not light intensity, it's something else like carbon dioxide or temperature. However, you cannot tell which one it is because it's not mentioned in the graph. So uh, these, this could come in paper four, that's the theory paper. It could come as, a, they could give you a graph and they could ask you to describe what's happening in the graph. So when, uh, once again, if they ask you to describe a graph, you don't have to give reasons. You just, li you literally just have to mention what's happening in the graph. So for this particular example, let's say, uh, from point A to point B, as the light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases. However, at one point, after one point, and then you have to say that at, after point C, um, the la in increasing light intensity, intensity does not have an uh, effect on the rate of photosynthesis. So that means that the, uh, the limiting factor is no longer light intensity. It's either um, temperature or carbon dioxide concentration. And that's that. So you could see similar graphs for uh, carbon dioxide concentration and temperature. This is just an example of light intensity and you should be able to describe those graphs as well. So this is uh, 6.2. Um, you'll be looking at the structure of leaf here. That's the syllabus. So you need to know uh, about some of the adaptations of leaves and you need to know about the parts of a leaf and then also how these particular parts are adapted to their functions uh, for uh, maximum efficiency. So the adaptations themselves, um, they are that most leaves have a large surface area and they're thin. Uh, so there's a reason for that. The large surface area maximizes the amount of sunlight falling on the leaf. And as you know, sunlight is required for photosynthesis. So as the surface area is increased, a larger surface area, a larger part of the leaf gets access to sunlight. And this um, increases the rate of photosynthesis. So more glucose is produced. Now the thin leaf, uh, creates less distance for gases to diffuse through, speeding up the whole process. So if you, um, gas exchange is really a huge part of uh, leaf functions because oxygen is a waste product in photosynthesis and it's also a reactant in uh, respiration while carbon dioxide is a product of respiration and it's a reactant in photosynthesis. So there's always gases moving in and out of the leaf um, we'll see from through which part, but for uh, this part, you, for now, you need to know that the, there's a small distance between the top part of the leaf and the bottom part of the leaf so that the gases can exchange faster. And then this is the leaf structure. So this is basically what you need to know. Um, so there's the upper epidermis. 
and the upper epidermis in the part in that part you need to know about the waxy cuticle the waxy cuticle um basically uh reduces water loss and then there's the mesophyll that's the main part of the leaf there the mesophyll is split into two parts there's the palisade mesophyll and the spongy mesophyll the palisade mesophyll is packed with chlor the cells themselves are packed with chloroplast and there's very few air spaces uh, so that part is really where most of the photosynthesis is happening and then their second mesophyll layer is called the spongy mesophyll now if you'll notice in the diagram that this part has many air spaces and um, the cells themselves are arranged a little irregularly so this is where the gases diffuse in and out of the leaf and this is where the gases are stored and then uh, you'll notice in the bottom ep the lower epidermis that's the next part it this lower epidermis contains holes called stoma um, and this is where the gases this is the point from which the gases leave and enter the leaf and the stoma is surrounded by cells called guard cells which basically control when the stoma is open and closed and once again after that the bottom most layer is the waxy cuticle which serves similar purpose to the one at the top that is to reduce water loss so um you've looked at the parts and now we'll be discussing how each part is adapted to its function so there's the cuticle that's the waxy layer that prevents water loss from top of the leaf like i already mentioned and then the epidermis epidermis is a transparent cell layer that allows sunlight to pass through to reach the palace itself so there is the epidermis but both upper and lower and it's transparent so be it being transparent allows sunlight to cross pass through it uh, and reach the cells which actually contain chloroplast uh, for photosynthesis to occur. Um, and then there's palisade, which is found at the top of the cell and contains uh, many chloroplast, which absorbs sunlight. So that's the palisade basophil layer. Uh, and it's at the top of the leaf um, and it contains many chloroplast. It's packed with chloroplast, like already mentioned, and it absorbs sunlight to carry out photosynthesis. And then below that, is the spongy mesophyll layer. It's the part with lots of air spaces. It's irregularly shaped. There's air spaces to allow gas exchange to take place. And there's there are chloroplasts, but it's not very packed. It's um it's not nearly as much as the palisade mesophyll. Because you'll have to remember palisade mesophyll is where most of the photosynthesis occurs. Like that's that's the only purpose for the mesophyll layer, palisade mesophyll layer. And then there's the vascular bundle. Now, if you'll notice in the leaf, there's the thick um, stem kind of thing in the middle that runs through the middle of the leaf. That's the vascular bundle, and it consists of xylem and phloem. It's something we'll look at uh, in in the coming slides. And basically, they they're responsible for transportation of nutrients in the plant. Um, yeah, so there's the xylem. It's a vessel which transports water and dissolved minerals and has uh, lignified walls made of cellulose. So here's the word again, cellulose. Um, xylem is basically a vessel. It's uh, not just in the leaf. It's also there in the other parts of the plant. Uh, however, we're talking just for the leaf right now. Uh, it, the xylem itself transports minerals and water. That that's important. This is something you need to remember. This could come in paper two. Uh, it could come in paper four. Uh, there could be fill in the blanks. There could be uh, a written question probably for two or four marks. And yeah, it has lignified walls. That is, the walls are made of uh, lignin. Uh, and yeah, that's basically it. And then we'll look at xylem more into detail in the next slide. There's phloem. Phloem is uh, the vessel which transports amino acids and sucrose. So there's two vessels, and both of them transport different things. This is something you have to learn, you have to memorize. Phloem transports sucrose and amino acids. Xylem transports water and minerals. And then there's the next part is stomata. Once again, um, it's the little hole at the bottom of the leaf that close and op opens and closes to allow gas exchange to take place. Um, they also prevent water loss. Um, and they also uh, prevent an undesirable movement of gases. So during the night, the guard cells uh, lose water, so the clo stoma closes. And during the day, the stomas open and they gain, they gain water and swell. 
So sometimes you'll notice that some of the leaf, um, they're a little limp at night uh, and then they're uh, more rigid in the morning. It's because this, the guard cells open and close. Uh, in, so in the night, they're closed. So there's no water movement occurring and it's a little limp. However, in the daytime, there's water movement and gas exchange happening. So um, it's more rigid. So once again, this is the leaf structure. There's the upper epidermis, uh, waxy cuticle in the top of the upper epidermis. Upper epidermis is transparent to allow sunlight through. And then the next part is the palisade mesophyll, packed with chloroplast. Most of the photosynthesis occurs here. Next part, spongy mesophyll, um, contains air spaces, uh, allows ga uh, for gas exchange to easily occur. This is this actually has more to do with diffusion. That's why there's so much air spaces. So you have to, uh, in your answers, you have to use the word diffuse. Gas is diffused in and out of the leaf. Um, and then after the spongy mesophyll, there's the lower epidermis. Once again, it's transparent. However, lower epidermis also have um, stomas and guard cells, um, which control gas exchange and water movement. So here's the stomata, right? A stomata is ba stoma is basically the opening that you see, and the two cells on the side are the guard cells. So each one is a guard cell, and they have the typical plant cell um, organelles. However, they're shaped a little differently. And um, this the circle one is what it looks like when the stoma is open, and the oval kind of shape is what it looks like when the stoma is closed. And then this is the xylem. The xylem, once again, transports water and minerals. And over here, the, the uh, contents move only in one direction. So it's a unidirectional uh, vessel. This is something you need to remember. And the walls of the xylem are made of lignin uh, ring. Uh, they're made of waterproof lignin. So that's why water does not escape from the xylem itself. And the water movement occurs due to transpiration and osmosis. Um, transportation is something you look more into in another chapter, that is uh, transport in plants. However, for now, this is all you need to know. Water movement is caused by transpiration and osmosis. Uh, the walls of the xylem are made of uh, waterproof lignin, and the xylem has unidirectional movement, and it tra transports water and xylem. So there's four main points for xylem. Now, this is the phloem. Unlike the xylem, phloem is a bidirectional vessel. So um, co contents, the contents itself are the amino acids and sucrose. So they can move in two di different directions. And um, each part of the phloem has a sieve plate, which um, allows sugar to pass from one cell to the next. And then um, phloem contains a small amount of cytoplasm along the walls. However, uh, the rest of the organelle, it, the content itself is greatly reduced because they, they're cons they consist of um, mostly cytoplasm because they have no other purpose than to fo form a vessel. So there's no photosynthesis occurring here. So that's why they don't need the vessel. Ma important part, important points of phloem, it's a bidirectional vessel. It uh, transports um, amino acids and sucrose. That's really it. You need, that's really all you need to know for phloem, and that's about it. So you should know uh, the functions of the xylem, the phloem. You should know the parts of the plants and its adaptations. So um, the adaptations could come. Um, they could give you a diagram, and then they'll be like, "Okay, this is A, B, C, D, and all that." And then they'll ask you in a table form, "What's the name of part A, and what's its function?" Uh, and or they might give you the function, and then you have to identify the letter. Which part are they talking about? So that's kind of, that's the kind of question that we come from. That could be around four to six marks. Um, I remember that question from one of the past papers, uh, although I don't remember which one. OK, so that's it for chapter six. Now let's look at some questions. This is May, June 2018. Why do, plant need, uh, why do plants need nitrate ions? So plants need nitrate ions for making amino acids. That's easy, it's straightforward, um, right off the bat. Which, uh, this is pe uh, February, March, 2016, which row shows the effects of deficiencies in nitrate and magnesium ions on plant growth. Um, okay, so effect of nitrate ion deficiency and the effect of magnesium ion deficiency. So 
uh, and nitrate ion deficiency will cause stunted growth. So that's uh, and then deficiency will cause yellow leaves. So that's option C. Okay, uh, which layer in the leaf contains? Uh, this is February March twenty twenty one. Which layer in the leaf contains interconnecting air spaces? Uh, this one's straightforward. Once again, that's option C. And that's it for chapter six. That was plant nutrition. Thank you so much for your time today. And we hope this video helped improve your knowledge on plant nutrition. Uh, see you again next time with another topic from IGCSE Bio.